all right your host now and yeah we are streaming live now and hey. can you make me co yeah can you make me co-host absolutely yeah thank you yeah okay we should be good to go i'm gonna go ahead and turn my uh share screen on while people are coming in yep sure thank you you're welcome Do we have anyone joining us, Anthony? Yeah, I'm not seeing anybody yet. Okay. <laughs> we'll give a we'll give it another minute or two and then I'll just go ahead as if there are people here. All right, maybe participants are on the way. <laughs> Hopefully, right? Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'll just pause the recording. And once okay. anybody comes, I'll, you know, resume the recording. Yep. Okay, great. I wonder if there's, oh, here we go. There's somebody. Good morning, Myra. How are you today? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Myra. So far, you're it. Which is okay. I'm going to go ahead anyway. Um, but um, so I want to welcome you. And as we're waiting for some other people to join, I'll go ahead and I'll get started. Um, if you have any questions, Myra, though, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or type it in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, it may be just taking people a little bit longer today to get through the uh, to get through the waiting room to, to join us. So um, but I want to welcome you and um, hang on tight because we're going to do some uh, we're going to do some reading knitting patterns. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm just going to do just a couple things to get my screen how I want it. And then I'll be ready to go. Okay, alrighty. So I want to welcome everyone to knitting pattern reading and yarn selection. This is a class on how to read a knitting pattern. So there are some assumptions that go along with this class. One is that you already know a little bit about knitting and purling, casting on, how to do a slip knot, how to bind off. And what I found as I've been teaching classes is people can pick up the skill of knitting relatively quickly. But what happens is when they want to go beyond your basic uh, rectangle of maybe a scarf or a dishcloth or that type of thing, they get stuck because they don't know how to read a pattern. So this is the next step um, that you might want to take. Or if you're trying to figure out whether knitting is for you at all, 
um, this might be a good way to check it out and see, do you, is, it, is it a skill that I think I might be able to pick up? So that's what we'll be covering. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm your guide uh, with Get Set Up. Um, I live in Everett, Michigan. Um, I spent 22 years in K-12 education as, a, as a, my most recent position was an elementary pr principal where I retired uh, last summer. Um, I spent two years with Michigan State University in the Office of K-12 Outreach. And I absolutely loved that part of my job. I worked with schools all over Northern Michigan that were uh, behind academically. And it was a very rewarding uh, uh, part of my, my position. Um, I love quotes. And this is one of my favorites. It's lasted me for a number of years. And that's people do the best they can with what they know. And when they know better, they do better. And what that means is I can en truly enjoy being a lifelong learner, which I consider myself. I love to learn new things and I think I'm better off when I do. Um, and so in January, I was scrolling uh, through my Facebook feed and I saw an advertisement for Get Set Up. And I started taking some classes with Get Set Up. And I was very excited that they had a philosophy of reaching older learners, which is very consistent with where I am in life. And so I, um, I applied to be a guide and here we are. Um, so Get Set Up, it allows us to learn things from one another so that we can do wonderful things in our future. Um, we can learn from each other. I, I love it if you're willing to have your camera on where that really helps me when I'm teaching uh, specifically when I'm teaching a skill like knitting, um, I can see by your facial expression whether you're understanding me or whether you're having a difficult time with it. So that's why it helps me if you have your camera on, but if you don't want to, obviously that's okay. Um, you can request a recording if you're here with me and I'd like to welcome you, Bobby. Um, you may request a recording after class by emailing help at getsetup.io and ask for a copy of Sarah's class today on reading knitting patterns, and they'll send a recording right out to you. What I love about that is it allows you to, um, if you miss something um, and you want to review it, you can certainly uh, do that at your, at your leisure, which I, I really think is an awesome thing. Or if you miss just one specific thing, that allows you to just go back and review that one specific thing. So feel free to do that. If you're joining my live stream today, I'd like to welcome you. I uh, love to have our live streamers with us, but know that if you would like to participate in a two-way conversation with me, just hop on over to that uh, getsetup.io website and register directly for a class, and that way you can come in. Um, I love it when I have learners with questions um, and tips um, that uh, help us all grow. So um, we love to have you in person, but if you're on live stream, love to welcome you here today. Get set up, nor I am paid to promote specific products, but just know that um, as a crafter, I certainly have my favorite products and I can't help but mention those, but I want you to know that no one is paying me to do that. Um, and nor is anyone paying get set up. So it's just out of the love for what I do that I share what I share. Uh, you, we're a small class today. So if you have questions, please uh, unmute yourself and ask, or um, if you want to type it in the chat, I'll try to follow that. I also have um, Anthony on board today, my, my teacher slash technical assistant, um, who will um, also help with questions, monitoring the chat. If you have anything that, uh, that um, Anthony can help you with, please feel free um, to, uh, to chat with Anthony. Hi, Myra. Love to see your beautiful face. All right. Any questions so far? Good to go. All right. So here's what we're going to be covering today. We're going to cover the parts of a pattern. We're going to cover how to read about rows and stitches. And I consider this the part of the pattern that it looks like a code. And we're going to break the code today. Um, and we're going to learn how to finish, uh, finish, look at the finishing instructions in a pattern. And then if we have time, we'll cover understanding and choosing yarns. Hello, Elaine. Glad you could join us today. Um, I'd love to know if you are already a, a knitter. Um, and if you are hoping, hi, Elaine. If you're hoping to learn anything specific, if you are saying, Sarah, I really wish you would cover this one thing about patterns. I would love to know what that is. And again, unmute yourself or type it in the chat box and I'll try to see what you're hoping to learn or whether you're already a knitter and just looking for next steps. 
What do you think? You're quiet. You're a quiet bunch today. All right. So this is. Oh, go ahead, Myra. I'm not. I want to learn how to knit. How to what? How to knit. Okay. Now, just know that I'm not going to cover the actual how to knit in this class. If you really want to learn how to knit, you're going to want to register for my learn to knit class where I cover all the way from how to do a slip knot, how to cast on, how to knit, and how to bind off. Um, and I think, I believe that's scheduled for next week. Um, so now you're welcome, obviously, to stay in this class. And, and this will help you when you learn to knit. But it may feel a little bit like having the cart before the horse. So stick with me if you want to and see if this is for you. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. I see. I, I'm just going to hold on just one minute. All right. So when you look at this list of of abbreviations. That's what this is. It's this huge list of abbreviations. I know for me, if, if somebody said to me, here, Sarah, you need to identify these 20 things. I, I would be done right then and there. That would be overwhelming to me. And I would say, forget it. The good thing about it is you can always find these abbreviations online. I'm going to send you a copy of these abbreviations afterwards as well in the follow-up email if you're here in the class with me. Um, and um, what you need to know is the more of them that you memorize, the faster your knitting will go because you don't have to look it up. But having to look it up is certainly not a showstopper. So don't let the abbreviations scare you. But I do want to go through these real quick and just talk about them. So the first one, and they're in alphabetical order. The first one is approximately, and the shorthand for that is approx. So if you see approx in a pattern, you know they're saying approximately or about. You might see that often when, um, when they say until it's about seven inches long or until it's about uh, 20, 20 inches long. Um, and that's where you might see approximately sitting. Um, B-E-G is the shorthand for beginning. So you might see this like at the beginning of a row. Um, C-O-N-T is short for continue. Um, D-E-C, decrease. You'll often see this when they tell you things like knit two stitches together because they're trying to get you to make your item smaller. So D-E-C would be the abbreviation for that. F-O-L is sometimes the abbreviation for following. So it might say, in all following row, rows, for example, so F-O-L. I-N-C, increase, op opposite of decrease, that's when you're going to add some extra stitches to your work. Um, K is, is almost always the abbreviation for knitting. And when it's talking about this kind of knitting, it's talking about the traditional knit stitch, not knitting as a hobby, but actually the knitting stitch, which is where knitting gets its name. Knit two together. This is the abbreviation for knit two together. This is a common uh, decrease stitch. LP is the abbreviation for loops. P is the abbreviation for purling, which is the, uh, usually you learn to knit and then you learn to purl. Um, purl two together is, uh, is how you would decrease on a purl side of a pattern. PAT, is the shorthand for pattern. And often you'll see this where it'll say continue, C-O-N-T, in the same P-A-T, in the same pattern. So you're repeating it over and over again. P-M, place a stitch marker. This is an advanced skill, pass slip stitch over. Um, R-E-M -R -R is for remaining, like uh, it might say, do this on all R-E-M stitches on your needle for all the remaining needle stitches. REP is for repeat. Here you've got your right hand, your right side, your, this is an interesting one, SKP, which equals slip one stitch, knit one stitch, and then pass your knitted stitch over. And that's another type of decrease. SL often used for slip, slip stitch, uh, SLST, um, together, TOG, wrong side of your work, with yarn in back and with yarn in front, 
that's often uh, a, a more advanced skill as well. Um, yarn over, yarn over is Y-O. Then we're gonna talk a, a, quite a bit about this one. You're gonna see either an asterisk in a pattern or you're gonna see a set of brackets. And that's telling you to repeat either what follows the asterisk or what appears between the two parentheses. Um, so hearing that list of abbreviations, does that cause any questions uh, to come to your mind? All right, we're gonna move on and we're gonna go through the parts of a pattern. So I'm gonna send you the link to this pattern um, when we get done. Um, and the reason I selected this pattern is because what it is, if you can see the photo here, is it's a variety of squares with different knitting stitches that when you get all done, you sew together to get one afghan. Now, what I, the reason that was appealing to me is because it gives you a chance to try some different uh, types of stitches if you're already a knitter and you wanna take your knitting to the next level. It also, each one of those squares could individually be made into a dishcloth by casting on around 40 stitches um, and knitting until your piece is square. Or you could, if you like one stitch in particular, um, you could turn that into an afghan with about approximately 150 stitches knitted or cast onto your needles. So um, that was why I, I chose this particular uh, pattern. It's got a lot of variety in it. So these are commonalities that you'll see when you pick up a knitting pattern. You're going to find a title. Um, and this one is the Bernay Knit Along Afghan. And it's telling you the skill, skill you need is knitting as opposed to crocheting. And I think your inspirations also does crocheting patterns. So there's your title. Um, this is the company that produces it. That is not always found at the top. Sometimes you find that at the bottom of the back, for example. And then it's gonna tell you how difficult is it to make this item. And if you're a beginning knitter, this is something that you may wanna look closely at. This tells us that this is in fact a knit pattern and that it is an easy pattern. Now, I will say in looking at it uh, in detail, I would not necessarily see say that every square is easy, but there are some squares that are easier than others. So looking for that pattern difficulty helps give you a clue if you're ready to begin it or not. Um, another part to the pattern that you'll see is this part called abbreviations or sometimes this is also called special stitches or both. So it's, remember I said, you know, it helps if you memorize some of the code, but you don't have to memorize it all. Good patterns will tell you the abbreviation. So for example, I, I mentioned that K was knit. Well, look, it's right here in the abbreviations. So even though that's the very most basic stitch in knitting, um, it still tells you the abbreviation and the abbreviations, which tells me that this is a pretty thorough, um, a pretty thorough pattern. I just realized that I forgot to make sure my phone volume was down. So let me grab that. Um, so that, and, and it tells you all kinds of things. Now this one is set up in alphabetical order from A to T or no, clear down here to Y for yarn over. This one's set up in alphabetical order. The other way that you oftentimes see them organized is in the order you will use them or the order that they're introduced in the pattern. So for example, if you were going to do a pass slip stitch over a PSSO, that might appear first in the list because you're going to do it first when you do the pattern from beginning to end. So those are the two ways that they might organize uh, the abbreviations or the special stitches. A tip that I'd like to give you right here is that if, if you read this, like let's look at uh, T5B, for example, which I have no idea what that means. I've never heard of T5B before. Um, it says that you should slip the next three stitches onto a cable needle and leave it at the back of the work, knit two, then purl one, then knit two from the cable needle. That sounds pretty complicated, right? And if I can't figure that out from looking at the pattern, one of the things that I can do is I can hop online and I can say uh, T5B knitting. 
And it's probably going to show me what a T5B is, and I can probably even find a video on it. Um, so just know that if you can't figure it out from the abbreviation and the written directions, you may be able to figure it out by looking for a video for it online. Um, and that's something that I've had to do several times for some complicated stitches. Another thing that the pattern is going to show you is what materials you need to complete the project. And I'm going to recommend that you always, if you're doing a project, that you always purchase enough materials to finish it. So, and the reason for that is yarn is often sold in dye lots, D-Y-E, like dyeing the yarn, because yarn is dyed in a big vat. And, um, it, and then they, you know, bundle all of that yarn up, they sell it. And then, you know, several months later, they might do another vat of yarn. And even though they use the same uh, recipe, there can be slight color variations. And so I've done this a couple times now where I've not purchased enough thinking I'd go back later and get it. I couldn't find my yarn in the same dye lot and there was a slight shade difference. And in a solid color, especially in a solid color piece of work, the shade difference shows up. So if you ever, if you can always purchase enough to finish your, um, your project. Now I will tell you that sometimes I have actually over purchased and I've always kept my yarn neatly in a um, plastic bag with the receipt. And if I get done in a, in a relatively reasonable amount of time and I have yarn left over, the stores have always taken that yarn back. Um, and so that has been, I, I would rather overbuy than underbuy and make sure I've got enough. So let's look at this materials section for a minute. In this materials section, um, it tells us that they used Bernay satin yarn. Um, and it tells us that a skein of Bernay satin would have 3.5 ounces of yarn on it or 200 yards uh, of, of yarn in a skein. That's important because if you wanted to swap it out for a different kind of yarn, you want to know how to do your math so that you get the same amount. And then it's telling us they use three different colors and they call it contrast A, contrast B, and contrast C. And they'll refer to it like that within the pattern. They'll say changing to contrast C or changing to C, blah, 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 blah. So that they've labeled the colors. And what that tells you is, let's say that you decided you wanted to do yours in uh, red, orange, and yellow. You could say, well, oh, my contrast A is gonna be red. My contrast B is gonna be um, orange. I can't remember what I said. And my contrast C is gonna be yellow. Then you would just swap yours out and make a note of that so that you know what to get. Um, and you can, uh, and all you have to know is a little bit about your yarn to be able to swap it out. So it's telling us if you were going to buy that Bernay satin, you'd need four balls of A and three balls of B and three balls of C. Other, the other thing that you might see these colors called is sometimes you see main color, abbreviated MC, and you'll see contrasting color instead of uh, like contrasting color one and contrasting color two. Same thing, different, um, different uh, way of, of telling you the same information. And then finally, it's gonna tell you on, on here um, what size needles you need. And in this case, you need one pair of size eight knitting needles or the size to obtain the gauge. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and you also need a pair of, or a circular knitting needle that is a size seven that's 36 inches long. All right, what questions might you have on what I've shown you so far? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, this, because it's such an extensive pattern, some of the main items in this pattern occur on the second page, and this is page two. Um, and what it's going to tell you is it's going to tell you the measurements. The measurements in this are for the completed afghan. So the completed afghan, if you did it just as it's written, should turn out to be approximately, and see there's the abbreviation for approximate, 42 by 50, 
or it gives you the centimeters and it also tells you that that includes the border that they're going to tell you to put on the afghan when you get done i'll talk just for a minute about gauging um, the gauge almost always appears um, and it's very, very important if it's something that you're going to wear or if it's something you're going to put on a doll, for example, and it's very important that it fits correctly um, because um, if, it, if you don't gauge it first, it could end up not fitting and it's, it's horrible to put a lot of time into a beautiful piece of work and then have it not fit. So what this gauge is telling us is that if you put 18 stitches on your needle, and you knit it in stocking stitch, which is knit one row, purl one row. If you knit it for 24 rows, your gauge, your swatch should end up being four inches wide by four inches tall. And if, and that was using the larger needles, which were the size eight. And so what that's telling you is if you knitted that swatch and it turned out be five by five, that means you're a loose knitter and you may wanna go down a size. If um, it turns out that yours is like three and a half by three and a half, that might mean that you're a tight knitter and you want to go up a size. So in an afghan, a dishcloth, a scarf, I don't see that as real important and I don't usually swatch things out in those kinds of projects, but I, I certainly do if it's something that I want to wear or something that it's important that it fits correctly when you get done. Then there are your instructions, and that's going to tell you what to do in order, row by row. Um, and then the other thing that I want to mention is photos. Um, so let me go back a page here and show you. This is a photo of the finished project. And because this is multiple blocks, it gives you a picture of every single block. And I really like that. Um, if I can't see a picture of it, it's kind of like trying to create some, trying to, sh uh, trying to throw a dart at a target and the target's not on the wall. The picture helps you know if you're on the right track. So I avoid patterns that don't also include photos. Now here's that code I was talking about. Um, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna sit here with this code. I'm actually gonna just show you some uh, very finite examples of how to read the code, but it applies once you understand the concept it applies to any pattern that you'd want to read. This is the last page of this. And this, um, this pattern was nine pages long. And like I said, I'm going to send you the link to this pattern so you can uh, download it for yourself if you'd like to. But this is page, uh, this is page nine. Um, and um, what page nine has on it is it has your finishing instructions. That's what's over here. And it's telling us to finish this project you want to pin the blocks to the measurements. So what happens sometimes is you get a square. Let's say your square is supposed to be 10 inches by 10 inches and the edges curl up. You may want to block that a little bit. And you would do that by pinning it down onto a surface, making it 10 inches square. I like to just mist mine with water and let it sit flat. And that way, when you uh, once it's dry, and you sew all your pieces together, they're all the same size. So blocking can really help with that process. They are telling you to block it by covering it with a damp cloth and leaving it on there until it dries. That works as well. Um, depending on the type of yarn, you could even use a steam, uh, like a steamer, or you could use a steam iron, but you don't want to put your iron right on your yarn. You want to hold it just above it because it can, if it's acrylic, for example, it can actually melt it. Um, and then it's telling you to go ahead and sew those together. Once you've got them sewn together, and it's showing you over here with this chart, um, this is what, uh, this is the order that you would put them together in. It then tells you how to knit the border on, which is really neat. Now, one other thing that this pattern has that not all patterns have are what they call charts. Actually, I said, yes, are charts. And what a some people knit from charts rather than from written instructions. I've done this once or twice. I don't enjoy knitting from a chart. I like the written instructions better, but I like it when they include a chart because again, I can kind of see at a glance if my pattern in my block is matching what they're saying. But there's a whole skill set where you can learn to knit 
by following charts instead of written instructions. Um, I, that's not what we're going to cover today, but just know that that's if you think you would work better from that visual than you would from the written instructions, that's certainly an option. And there are online free tutorials on that out there. All right, what questions do you have on? And let me go back one page. Are there any questions so far on the pattern, on understanding how the pattern is set up? Good to go? Okay, no questions. We'll keep going. All right, so casting on is almost always abbreviated CO. And there are several methods of casting on and the pattern doesn't usually tell you the type of casting on to use. Um, I use what they call the long tail cast on, and that's the method I teach if you take my learn to knit class. Um, I like it, uh, it's my favorite one because um, I feel like it's a real secure one because it uses two, uh, two tails of yarn, the working yarn and the tail. And so I feel like it's more secure but it's also a little bit more complicated. Um, if you don't, if you think that you want to learn something simpler, I might recommend the single tail cast on um, or the wrap cast on. Um, I've had some learners who use this knit cast on and if you know how to do a knit stitch, that knit cast on looks real neat, real easy to do as well. Um, but long tail is my favorite. It's the method I've used uh, most of my life. Um, so another assumption in the pattern is that you know that you're going to begin the cast on process with a slip knot. So you're going to do your slip knot, then you're going to cast on your stitches. A tip that I like to share with people is if you have trouble, um, if you have trouble uh, getting your cast on row too tight, one of the things that you can do, and I'm going to I'm going to actually stop the share for just one second. I'm going to switch my camera um, so that you can see. I'm going to actually show you something here. Um, and oh, let me turn my camera the correct direction. That would help you. <laughs> um, and so if I was going to cast on and I always get my stitches tight, which pulls your work in, and especially if it's like the hem of a sweater, it makes it difficult to put the sweater over your head. Normally you would cast on over one needle like this, um, but if you cast on over two needles, like, so I'm gonna do just a simple cast on. So this is, this is a very simple cast on. And I would do that over two needles like this. Then when I get done, I pull one of the needles out, turn my work around, and now my, my cast on row is relatively consistent, but it's loose and it's not going to tighten my work. So I, I love that little tip when you're casting on. Um, and then, um, or another thing that you can do if you don't like that is you can, um, you can cast on on a larger needle and that works as well. So if it calls for a size eight, you might, for example, want to cast on, uh, on a size 10 needle and that would give you that bigger, uh, that bigger row to work from. Oh, I gotta switch my cameras back. Sorry about that. Uh, questions on casting on before I move on. All right, does that get you back to my screen? Can you see my, uh, my, my slide presentation again? Thank you. All right, so here's an example of breaking the code for a row. So what I would love to see is something that looks like um, row one, knit all the stitches. Row two, purl all the stitches. I know exactly what to do because it's all written out. However, what you're likely to see is more like example two, where row one is abbreviated R1, and then you see a colon, and then it just has a K. What that means is knit all the stitches on the row. And then row two is abbreviated R2 with a colon, and then it has a P. You're gonna purl all the stitches on the row. That's, that's how the code works. 
Now, if it was that simple, wouldn't knitting be easy for everyone, but it's not. So unless you're knitting in the round, so in knitting in the round would be like if you're using a, a bunch of double pointed needles to make a hat, for example, or a sock, or if you're using a circular needle to make like a tube for a sweater, um, those are called rounds. The assumption if you're not working in the around is that you're working in rows. And what that means is that when you get to the end of the row, you're going to turn that needle around, put it back in your left hand and work across the row again. So that's an assumption um, that they're not going to necessarily spell out for you. All right. So here's an example. This came out of, I bought a really neat um, uh, how to knit book and I did it to help me prepare for teaching the class. And this was an example of one of the dish or one of the swatches in the book that could easily be made into a dishcloth, for example. This one had a name, it was called the Pearl Ridge. And I like, I wanna just share what, what it's telling you. If you just find a stitch that you really love and you wanna turn it into a dishcloth, for example, I would recommend that you would use size eight needles and some cotton crochet thread. 100% cotton crochet thread, if you wanted to make a dishcloth out of this, for example. And so what this is telling you is you could make your dishcloth any size you wanted, or if you wanted to do this in acrylic and make it into a blanket, all that matters is you use an odd number of stitches. So if you're gonna make it into a dishcloth, 41 is an approximate size on a, on a size eight needle that you'd wanna use. And this is, how, this is how the pattern reads. It reads row one, parentheses RS. Does anybody recall what RS means from our def, from our abbreviations? Right side. Perfect. Thank you, Elaine. It means right side. So it's telling you right from the get-go that that's going to be your right side. If that's very important to you, you just put a little marker on that right side so that you always know where your right side is. And you can buy markers, but you can also use a piece of a different color of yarn and just put it through and mark your right side so you know where it is. So on right side, it's telling us we're gonna knit, which is abbreviated K. On row two, we're gonna purl. Now's where it starts to get a little bit complicated. Row three, and, and watch the punctuation because the punctuation tells us a ton. So it's telling us start with knit two. We're done with that knit two. We're done with those first two stitches. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna revisit those first two stitches in row three. That's what that comma is telling us. Then see the asterisk. And then it says, purl one, knit one, semicolon, REP, -E which, what did that one stand for? REP, -E do you remember what REP -E stood for? Repeat, yeah, I can read your lips, Elaine, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Repeat from asterisk to end. So what that's telling us is if we go back to the beginning of the asterisk and we look at what's between the asterisk and the semicolon, we just purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one, all the way across. So we're going to start with knit two. We're done with those first two stitches. All the rest of the stitches all across the rest of the row, we're gonna purl one, knit one. That's what that means. And then row four, we're gonna purl. And they may have abbreviated that. They could have abbreviated that P, remember? And then it's saying repeat rows one through four until it's approximately square. And then bind off with that right side facing you. Bind off could have been abbreviated BO. Once in a while, and I think this is more common in the European patterns, you'll see CO instead of BO, that's for cast off. They call it cast off instead of bind off. Um, I see bind off more frequently in the patterns that I work with. So back to this repeat rows one through four. So when you get done with row four, purl, you, after you've purled that, you're gonna go back to row one, you're gonna knit row one. Again, which is really now row five. And then you're gonna purl row six. You're gonna do this fancy thing again on row seven. You're gonna purl row eight. You're gonna knit row nine and you're gonna repeat that until it's square. 
what questions might you have on reading the pearl dish ridge dishcloth pattern? Think you could do it? Yeah, my only question is, it looks like it's got three extra rows on the end. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so yeah, you're right. So what you've got, so let's see. So you've got an extra, you got, here's your last pattern row right here. Then you got, you're gonna have your pearl row and you're right, they added an extra row before they bound up. Good eye, Elaine. They they added an extra row before they bound before they uh, did their bind off row. Uh, I was gonna guess that it's because they were on the wrong side, but I don't think so. I think they just plain that's just what they did. So, but that was good eye. All right. Uh, now you might be saying to yourself, Sarah, how am I ever gonna remember? what row I'm on, what stitch I'm on. And there are lots and lots of methods to make that happen. One is um, you can get a stitch counter. And these are examples of stitch counters. Um, and, uh, and you can get stitch markers. Uh, I was, uh, had a learner on a couple weeks ago who said she marks across her needle. She puts one of these rings on about every 10 stitches. So she knows at a glance where she is uh, in her row. I thought that was a clever idea. Um, also, sometimes what you'll see that I really love, and we're going to have a pattern that shows that, is sometimes they'll put the number of stitches you should have once you complete a row in parentheses at the end so you can check. So I think I like to check my stitch count every 10 rows or so if, I, if I'm knitting something larger. Uh, more often, if I'm beginning and it's difficult, uh, you can backtrack if you need, need by ripping out your work, which I don't love to do in knitting. It's a little bit more complicated than backtracking with crocheting. Um, you can also just use tally marks on a paper. Uh, you don't have to have any kind of fancy stitch marker, um, but I, I do that a lot of times on the edges of my patterns. A lot of times if it's a pattern I think I may reuse, I'll make a copy of it on my copier and I then I my copy I can write all over and not feel like I'm uh, wrecking the pattern um, and I do that a lot of times and that helps me track my stitches too um, and then remember always look at your fin finishing steps at the end of the project all right let's look at this this is getting now a little bit more complicated and I had someone on the last time I taught this particular class who said Sarah this is not a beginning knitting class no this is a how to read the pattern class to help you get brave enough to try it. Okay, and so stick with me um, because this is where, this is where the magic happens. You unlock the world of knitting if you can read a knitting pattern. Um, okay, so this one is called the broken slip stitch. And to turn this one into a dishcloth, what the pattern said was to use multiples of four plus seven. So, I would love it if they would say multiples of four and then a plus sign seven, because I, I think, well, does that mean multiples of 11? No, it means multiples of four. And then no matter how many you add, add seven more to make the pattern. So if I was going to make this into a dishcloth and I know a dishcloth and knitting on size eight needles with cotton, cotton thread is approximately 40 stitches. I did a combination of four times eight to get to my 32. And then I added seven, which led me then to cast on 39 stitches. Um, so that's what that multiple. And so let's say I was going to make this into an Afghan and I know an Afghan takes approximately 150 stitches. I take hundred, I would take 150 stitches minus, uh, but I would say, oh, that 150 divided by four. Hmm, that's that's hard math for me. So I'm going to do 160 instead, which is easily divided into four sets of 40 divisible by four, and then I would add seven. So I would cast on 167 stitches to turn this pattern into an afghan. Um, most 
patterns though that are like the yarn inspirations pattern that I showed you you're you're going to get an exact product so they're going to tell you exactly how many stitches to cast on and you don't have to do the math that I just did I'm just demonstrating a, a skill that you can do from swatches um, okay so what is this pattern telling us it's telling us abbreviation for row one ws was wrong side nice Donna I'm wrong side Here's that asterisk, asterisk again, asterisk again, knit three, purl one, semicolon, repeat from asterisk until the last three stitches and then knit three. So what this is telling us is we're going to knit three, purl one, knit three, purl one, knit three, purl one until we're at, at stitches that would be 37, 38 and 39. And we're going to knit 37, 38, and 39, and that completes row one. We just un, we just broke the code for a little bit complicated of a direction, right? Row two. Oh, look at this one. Got a little different skill set in here. So it's telling us knit three, asterisk right at the beginning, knit three. Now this is telling us with yarn in back. That was the abbreviation for with yarn and back, W-Y-I-B, slip, S-L was slip, one purl wise. And what that's telling us is when we slip it from the left needle to the right needle, we're going to slip it over as if we were purling, going in from the purling direction as opposed to going in from the knitting direction. And then we're going to repeat from that asterisk to those last three stitches. I think this is a typo. I think this should be knit three. Um, and then it's saying every time you're on a right side row, um, you're gonna you're gonna repeat. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I saying that correctly? Repeat rows one and two four times more. Yeah. Oh, yep. That that's oh, I'm sorry, it's rows. Sorry, I forgot my I forgot what the abbreviation was. This one is rows three through 10. For those rows, you're going to repeat rows one and two, four times more. Then when you get to row 11, you're going to change it up again. So now you've got this other set of stitches. So if we go over here, what it's saying is rows one through 10 are making this part of the pattern block right here. And rows 11 through 20 are making this portion of the pattern block that's how you get that back and forth look. So in that case, you're just kind of adjusting where you're putting the stitches by knitting five, asterisk, purl one, knit three, repeat from that asterisk to the last two stitches, knit two. Row 12, knit five, with the yarn now in back, slip one purl wise, remember we were, we were slipping one purl wise up here, knit three, repeat from the star. And then you're going to yarn over the last two stitches, different skill, and knit two. All right, and then it's telling you to repeat those rows four times more, repeat rows one through 20. So you're going to have this whole pattern set twice, and then BO was bind off. What questions might you have on this pattern? Could you do it? Okay, Elaine, I'm seeing a yes. All right. Another one. This is lace. I, I love the lacy openness, but it takes a different knitting skill. It would be more of an intermediate to an advanced skill. And um, this one is multiples of two plus two. So I cast on 40 and added two. Um, on the right side, you're going to knit one, asterisk, yarn on yarn over knit two together that yarn over is what keeps your stitch number the same down to the very last stitch and then knit one in your row two you're going to purl in row three you, you're very similar to this first one except this time we're going to knit two together and then yarn over so that gives you your alternating holes and then you're going to repeat row and then you're going to purl row four and repeat until it's approximately square Bind off with your right side facing. Questions about that one? Are you going to want to do an edge on this if you're using it for a dishcloth? 
I would uh, usually crochet an edge just to keep it strong. I would too, Elaine. That's exactly what I would do. Um, but you could also probably find a knitting border that would be relatively easy to do. Knitting border, I think, is sometimes a little bit challenging to pick up your edge stitches. It's easy on the cast on and the bind off row, a little harder on those edges, um, but you could do it either way. Um, and that's a great idea to keep it strong uh, that way. Um, in the finishing, let's talk about binding off for a minute. Once you bind off, um, you're gonna weave in your ends. And then we already talked about blocking. I like to use T-pins when I block. A T-pin is like a sewing pin, like a regular sewing pin that has a bar across the top. And what I like about that when I'm blocking my knitting is it keeps my knitting from popping off where uh, like a dressmaker's pin that just has a head on it doesn't hold it well. Um, and then um, make sure you read your label. So you're not, for example, if you used a steam iron over 100% wool, you might shrink it. So make sure you understand what your, um, what your yarn will allow you to do as far as blocking it. But this is that process I was explaining earlier, uh, if you need to block your work. Where I've seen blocking uh, to be somewhat important is in clothing. Um, a lot of stuff anymore I don't block. If you're wondering where could I start with some beginning projects if I wanted to try my skills at reading a pattern, these would be good examples of beginning projects. Scarves, blankets, placemats, table runners, wall hangings, pillow covers, and dish claws. Is anyone working on a knitting project currently? No knitting projects going, huh? Well, I'm working on one, but it's uh, translating for a friend, doing a cable sweater, re doing a cable sweater that she got, she made 30 years ago that she can't remember the name of. And I'm trying to translate from a chart to English because she can't read charts. And it's been an adventure. So Elaine, I, I think you're the one that does the crochet social hour, right? That I attended yep. a couple weeks ago. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think you were talking about that during that that social hour. That was, uh, that's quite an undertaking. I'm up to I, page 84. Oh my gosh, I wish you a lot of luck with that <laughs> one. <laughs> All right, we're at 1052. So I'm gonna hit this next part rather quickly. And this is the understanding the yarn. Um, I am going to give you this link uh, to this chart. But what this shows us is it shows us that yarns come in quite a variety, all the way from zero up to seven. Uh, zero is almost a thread. And seven is quite jumbo. Um, and so it's good. I would say, though, however, average, like if you walked into a Walmart and bought a skein of yarn in their yarn aisle, the majority of their yarns are going to be a number four. Um, and four is a good medium weight. Um, and yes, just like that, Elaine, exactly. That's a four yarn. Um, the, what I was showing you when I was uh, showing you how to cast on over two needles, that was a cotton yarn that was also a size four. Um, that's a good starter size yarn if you're uh, wanting to learn how to knit. There are three types of yarn uh, that I could find, animal fiber, plant fiber, and synthetic. The animal fibers are your wools, uh, llama wool, a pack of wool, um, what have you. Those are the most highly allergenics. So if you have some yarn allergies, um, animal fibers might be, might be the last thing that you'd wanna try. Plant fibers, the one that I am absolutely loving is bamboo. Um, the band, they, sometimes you can get 100% bamboo, which is a little bit expensive, but even if you get a, like a cotton yarn with bamboo added to it, the softness is just amazing. And then your synth synthetics are like your, um, your acrylics. And you can also know that you can get blends of all of these. And it's, all, it's usually on your yarn label and it's good to know what your yarn is made up of so you know how to uh, take care of it when you're done. These are examples of just a pile of different kinds of yarns. Um, and I can tell by looking at it that this, this yarn over here is probably that size four. 
This one might be a size three that you might make like a baby blanket out of. This one's probably like a six or so, maybe even a seven because it's got those big bumps in it and you're going to use bigger needles on those. So that's good to know as well. Everything that you need to know about the yarn that you're buying is usually on the label. That's that size that we were talking about. Elaine held up that skein. That size is telling you how big a round a, a strand is really. Um, that's what that's symbolizing. It's also going to tell you the weight of the skein. This one says there's seven ounces on it. It's going to tell you the length of the, of the string. In other words, if you took this all apart and measured it from one end to the other, there would be 415 yards there. It's going to tell you what's in it. This one's 90% acrylic and 10% alpaca wool. So that may require some, launch, some specific laundering instructions. And then remember we were talking about gauging earlier. If you wanted to make a swatch, um, it's going to tell you what to do to gauge your yarn swatch to find out if you're using the correct size needles with that yarn. Here's a close-up of a gauging spot that's showing you, and we're talking about knitting today. If you cast on 16 stitches and knitted for 22 rows on a size nine needle, it should turn out approximately four by four. So that's a nice little uh, tip. Um, there's lots of ways to store your yarn. Um, I like to store um, specific yarns in Ziploc bags with a copy of the label in it, especially my wools. Um, I make a, I make some uh, felted wool projects that require a special yarn and I keep it separate from all the rest of my yarn because I don't want to mix it up. Um, and I also like to use bins. So I have some, this is not my, my a photo of mine, but at home for my acrylics, which I've acquired quite a few of over the years, I have them in those uh, plastic rubber made bins sorted by color, by color or color families. Um, and that way now at a glance, I can pull out yarn and I don't have to buy a, a whole skein if I only need a, a scrap, for example. So those are some nice little tips. I'm going to send you all of these resources in the follow-up email today so that you um, can uh, look at any of the things that I have shared with you. Um, what questions might you have on patterns or pattern reading? I'm going to just I'm going to just summarize these last slides and then I'll unshare my screen and I'll stay on for questions that you might have. So I want to just thank you for being here today. Um, know that you can share your experiences uh, on, on lots of social media, but if you want to talk directly to someone, you can email Liz at GetSetUp.io. She loves to listen to what you have to say, um, whether it's a complaint or an idea or a, or a praise. Um, she's always ready and willing to, um, to take your feedback. Um, some related classes, uh, learn to knit, learn to crochet, learn to read a crochet pattern are all classes I've got coming up actually. I've also got uh, calligraphy coming up. I did that once last week, really had for the first time last week, that was very fun. Um, and I'm also doing one on finding crafts on, print, on Pinterest. Um, and after we're done, I'm gonna send you notes with all the resources that I mentioned. Just know that you can scroll down you can find this Give Feedback button, and if you click on it, this is going to pop up. You can tell me what you thought about today's session. You can tell me what you thought about me, um, and you can give us ideas for the future. I read every bit of, um, every bit of feedback that comes in um, that is very helpful to me in knowing how to adjust my classes for future learners. Um, and then know that you can always invite a friend. And we'd love to have you do that. So I'm gonna stop my share at this point. I'm gonna go back to my regular screen and I'd like to just stay on here for our last minute or two together for any questions or comments you have about knitting or the class or just interest you might have in next steps with knitting. Myra, I saw your comment, thanks. I'll look forward to seeing you in that class. Someday I'd like to do um, a sweater just for me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it 
it funny how when we do these hobbies and crafts, we give it all away. I, I was sitting in my house one. I have eight grown children. And so I have done project after project after project for my children. I was sitting in my house and I'm thinking, I don't see much here that I've made because <laughs> I've given it all away. <laughs> what is it that happens that we do that? <laughs> That's craziness. Uh. All right. Well, you've been a wonderful class. I really appreciate you being here today. Um, and uh, again, you know, I'd love to hear your feedback and I look forward to seeing you in a future class. Elaine, when's your next uh, crochet social hour? Um, it's June 10th. Okay. It's uh, seven o'clock Eastern. Okay. And it's, if you're looking for it, it's now um, chatting about crafts. So we're not limiting ourselves just to crochet. We're going to throw in knitting and tatting. This next time we're doing tatting and needle felting. Lovely. That's so, lovely. All right. We're starting there. Who knows where we go? All right. Well, I, I'm hoping I can join you. I, I may be traveling that day. I'm not quite sure yet. I'm in Ohio right right now, actually, with my with my son and his wife and their new baby. When I'm ah. having a class. <laughs> um, but I may... Um, I may be traveling that day, but if I'm not, I'll join you. I, I've got the stuff to needle felt, but I've never done it. So exactly. I would love to, I would love to hear what others are doing. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone. You've been a wonderful class. I look forward to seeing you next time.